to the very first episode of On the Clock with Caroline. I'm Caroline Clark, Chief Brand Officer, Women of Power at Black Enterprise. And I'm really thrilled to be launching this series where um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time with a broad cross section of people, just trying to understand how we are navigating through this extraordinary time in our lives day by day, one day at a time. That's the only way to take it, right? So our very first guest, I'm thrilled, is um, someone who's become a, a dear friend of mine in a very short time. Crisis has a way of creating, um, you know, intensified friendships, which is a silver lining. So um, our first guest is a social activist, um, an entrepreneur, and author of a beautiful book, The Bold World, a memoir of family and transformation. If you are looking for something to help get you through this time, this is a perfect way to spend it. Read this book. It is beautiful, it is moving, it is honest, and it is original. And it discusses things that we need to discuss as a community, um, particularly in the Black community. And so I am thrilled to welcome Jody Patterson. Hi, Del. Hi, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. So listen, I'm not trying to call you out, but I'm seeing a little bit of subway tile and I'm wondering where in the world you are, girl. So, you know, it's there are seven of us in my house that are all um, needing space to work and to learn. And so I'm in my bathroom. <laughs> it's, it's literally the only space that's available and that has light. And I'm hoping it has Wi-Fi. Wi -Fi. Well, it has light, it has wifi, and it has good acoustics. So, you know, oh, well good. done. Good, good, good. <laughs> now, well, something is, everything is flexible these days, right? We have to be mobile and flexible. You have to be super, super flexible. Um, so, you know, the first thing we need to talk about is, um, is the fact that you are one of the very fortunate people who actually um, had COVID-19 and came through it and thank God are on the other side of it. So these stories are only just starting to emerge. Um, and I think it would be helpful to talk to us about what exactly you experienced um, in terms of symptoms and how you navigated just getting through to recovery. So I'm now weeks out of um, the first symptom. So I'd say probably now five weeks. Um, yeah and if not more, and I'm just now started piecing together all of the pieces, all the components. For a long time, it was a blur, and I couldn't quite connect the dots, but now that I've had some time to think and to look at my notes, because I journaled through this whole process um, and stayed in touch with friends like you, um, I am seeing the, the, trying to see the big picture. Yeah. My symptoms were so atypical. Um, I had exhaustion, right? But I'm a mom of five. I'm <laughs> on any given Wednesday, I'm exhausted. But I was really, really tired um, that 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 particular week, and I was traveling a lot and working a lot. And so I had some exhaustion. I had um, when the symptoms really kicked in. I had a migraine. I had a debilitating migraine that was like a piercing um, knife almost in my head, and then all the way down my spine. Wow. So much that I couldn't get out of bed. Um, and then I had chills and these strange body twitches that I can only sort of put into language now because I'm hearing other people have them, sort of like spazzes, mm -hmm. where almost like currents uh, going through your body. And so I was feeling that in my limbs, my arms and my legs and, and um, these sort of surges. Uh, a slight fever. I barely was at 100, sometimes 99. And that was just for a few days. Yeah. Um, loss of smell and it's funny because that loss of smell I just realized it was loss of smell for a long time I was thinking that I was like I haven't showered in a couple of days because I was really sick I don't smell right right <laughs> um, isn't that strange <laughs> I thought it was just I don't I know I, I noticed that I wasn't smelling the things that I would normally smell air right. and body and breath um, and the things that were around me, flowers at the time, I was in the hospital. Right. Uh, but now that the language is coming out and the stories are being shared, I realized I had lost my sense of smell. Yeah. Um, and brain fog, which has continued, and I don't mean that in a funny way, I really mean I can't get words out. I have to say, what's that thing that looks like this that sits over there? And they're like, blender, mom, blender. So brain fog. And that was, um, 
a lot of for 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 weeks I've, I've i've maintained that some of those and now you know weeks later i'm still feel i have zero fever i've never had any respiratory issues thank thank goodness um but if you looked at what the news was tracking as symptoms for covid and symptoms for like the flu you usually they were putting me on the flu like my symptoms were falling more on the flu side chills and shakes um you know but I but you were tested, and so you wanted that. I mean, testing testing is such an issue. It remains an issue, right? There's so many people who've had symptoms, and in some cases, severe symptoms, but they haven't been able to get tested. In your case, you're one of the people who actually shows up in the statistics because you tested positive. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is how who gets tested and uh, who doesn't is a lot of it is timing. You know, mm -hmm. when in the crisis, you know, did you hit? Yeah. Uh, a lot of it is um, regionality. Where are you, right? What state is your state in? What state of emergency is your state in? Right. Uh, and then also all the biases. Who uh, deserves, you know, quick, immediate response? Yeah. Right? You and, had and to really, you had to really advocate to be tested, right? You you you've talked about showing up as a black woman, you know, needing medical assistance, and particularly now when the statistics are making it devastatingly clear that the African American and Black community, the LGBT communities, are overarching in both contracting and dying from this virus. Um, you know, that self advocacy and seeking medical assistance and having access to it becomes critically important. So, can you talk a little bit about your experience with that? You know, I'm so used to being an advocate, right? All day long, I advocate for my kids in my home, my five children. I advocate for children all over the, the world. I advocate for um, communities that have, um, what I, that I feel have been overlooked. Um, it's particularly LGBT communities and black families and moms. And then here I find myself in a, in a situation where I, I needed someone to advocate for me. And I had no physical presence of an advocate. I found myself, I took myself to the hospital uh, in like whatever I could grab, it was like a black hoodie, some men's pajama pants and some Nike sneakers. And I showed up and no one saw me in a, in a sense, right? And I know that is an issue in terms of just hospitals in general, you become a, a patient. Um, but I felt that and I felt that multiplied as a black woman and a black woman without a title and a black woman without, you know, I hate to say it, a purse and a bag and the things that our mothers and our grandmothers have taught us when you walk outside you put your best foot forward so that people see you and understand you and so in the hospital I mean, what we find is that we just don't have all of the presentation that lets people know something about us yeah. and so we rely then we're, we're, we're subjected to our biases and i felt that um and so i had to really call up i had to think strategically when i was sick which is a hard thing to do but i had to think about who's going to advocate for me Who's going to be able to speak the language of hospitals, which is a serious language, um, and, the, and the language of um, authority and compassion? <laughs> it's like a big, it's a, it was, and I had to, I literally made a list in my journal. Okay, you know, who are the folks that are going to, who are on my A team? Yeah. And I just went down that list and I made sure I stayed in touch with them every single day for the two weeks that I was in the hospital. Yeah. Now, you know, we're, we're all living in a reality where there is more isolation than we're accustomed to, right? So you have people in your home. Some of us have people in our homes. Others live alone. But regardless of where we are on the spectrum, there's greater isolation. There's less, you know, there's more social distancing. Um, but when you were in the hospital, um, you were completely isolated um, and quarantined. And I know you developed sort of a rhythm that kept, that kept you going and got you through it. And I think that can be really instructive to all of us as we're dealing with, you know, sort of the rigidity of the restrictions around how much we're able to reach out and, and see other people and do things. Talk about that system, because I, I think what's important in this case in particular is that you were navigating time and space, but you were also navigating fear, because there's still so many more questions around this virus than answers and you didn't know how bad it was gonna be or what your mortality reality would be and your family couldn't even come visit you. So how did you get through that time? Ooh, sorry, um, I mean, luckily I have this 
uh, setup typically in my normal life pre-COVID where I spend a lot of time alone. I'm a person that loves pattern. Um, I have all kinds of rituals that other people think are annoying, but they work for me. And so I applied those because it's hard in crisis to do something different. Oftentimes we do what we know. And I, I know pattern and I know habit and I know things that are self-soothing. Yep. So I tried to remember to do the things that I really enjoy from the hospital room, which was, you know, just a tiny little box. Right. Um, and so I uh, made sure that I walked <laughs> in circles every day and stretched, you know, little stretches. Um, I made sure that I cleaned. I mean, I like to clean my house. And so I would say to the nurse, no, I'll clean. I'll get the garbage. She's like, but you can't leave. I'm like, but I'll just pack it up and you know, I, I did the things, I cleaned my room, I um, wrote for 10 hours a day, sometimes, literally 10 hours a day. Um, I exercised, which is really just stretching for two, I meditated. I did my, I had my, um, my lotions and body washes and facial washes, and so I did that process every day. Um, you know, it was, it was pretty regimented and strict, but I had to fill up 20, you know, 12 hours sometimes without going nutty. Yeah. And so like, I, have to, I think about that. And I, when I came out of the hospital, I came back home, I still remember that feeling of, okay, what makes me happy? And I tried to share that with my family. We have to remember what makes us happy um, and then do those things. Because in crises, you're kind of panicking and you're like, so what remembering, recalling what makes us happy um, in these moments is really good. For me as a writer, I enjoy writing. My folks were like, you don't have to work in a hospital, Jody. And I said, no, writing for me, it happens to be my work, but it's really my passion. So right. finding these, these moments um, and re repeating them over and over again. Yeah. But it's like a long game. <laughs> this is not a short game. We're not talking about doing them one day. It's like we have to remember to repeat the joy every single day. Yeah. I know your, your role as a mom mm -hmm. is intrinsic to everything that you are and everything that you do. Um, and you happen to be a mom of five, which, you know, anybody looking at you, of course, never thinks that. Um, and I know that the people in the hospital probably thought you were 25, but you're twice that. And that was the problem. They kept right. thinking I was a young, naive girl, black right. girl. Um, not a seasoned of, woman. Not a seasoned woman, not a seasoned black woman, right, yeah. Yeah, but I, I know that role as a mother is critically important to you, and you happen to be a mom who is navigating all of this with five children in very different spaces and stages of life. So I know your daughter Georgia, your, your first uh, baby girl, is overseas in Europe, and then you have um, boys you know, at home of different ages and stages. Can you talk about navigating that and and how do you deal when you have a child who is still overseas you can't put hands on her um, mm -hmm. even though she's a grown woman um, and then you know you have boys at home who are at different stages how are you helping all of them to navigate through this and stay positive it's like what um tony morrison said the thing she said what's grown to a mother exactly. grown don't mean anything right exactly. i wanted all of my babies from 28 down to 10 with me um, and that was impossible because I wasn't even able to see anyone. Um, I was in, you know, when I was in the hospital, but also when I got home, I was trying to be, to distance myself from folks because I had an enormous amount of guilt for being sick um, and sick for so long. So I had to figure out ways to navigate, I had to figure out ways to parent remotely um, and mother remotely and stay connected remotely. And, and, and part of that was actually saying, I can't do the things I always do, <laughs> right? So I can't actually, I'm not teaching, you know, um, very clear messages. I'm not setting boundaries from, you know, miles away. I'm really just, I was trying to just interact. So each kid I chose to do something with. My youngest, we did an hour of riddles, right? Because usually I'm like, oh, how old is your youngest? 10. And, you know, he's the one that comes at me all day long. Mom, would you rather jump off a plane or dive deep into the ocean and not know how to swim, <laughs> right? He's full of riddles and what, what if, what if? And I usually don't have any time for that um, or I can get through maybe one or two of the what ifs and then I'm off to doing something else. But I was like, baby, I got hours for you. Give me all your riddles, give right. me your best what ifs. So we spent a really good time doing that. My oldest who's in um, Switzerland, she and I 
talked like almost like two grown women. <laughs> I say almost because she's always my baby, but we had a different type of conversation and it wasn't about me teaching her. It was just about us listening. Um, I have one son who's 14 and he's probably the one who thinks I know the least. Um, and like every 14 year old, right? Right, like every 14 year old. And so I spent a lot of time with him just telling, oh, I was reading his manga books. I picked up one of his manga books and I said, I'm committing to reading an entire manga book. I don't like them. I, it's totally not my style of literature, but right. I'm committed to it. So now I'm in, on to page 100 in uh, one of his manga books. Okay. So I just chose, you know, one thing to go deep in yeah. with my kids. And that, that was parenting for me. Yeah. I, I wasn't able to set the rules. I wasn't able to make sure they had their teeth brushed or their homework done, but it was about some sort of like listening and interacting that I had not been able to do on that level um, in the past months because I was working or busy or cooking. Yeah. Um, and that took, a, that took some patience because I was very, I take a lot of, um, I define myself in my parenting for better or for worse. You know, people say don't, live through your kids. I'm like, you haven't had a child yet. <laughs> of course we live through our children. What else are we supposed to do? Right. Um, but so I, I define myself through my parenting. And when I didn't, when I wasn't able to parent in the same way, got really sad and really depressed. Uh, and that can only last for so long. So I had to find new ways. And, and on top of the fact that we were miles apart, um, we also are a family um, that is blended. So I've been married twice and I have two ex-husbands. Um, and so that dynamic also plays into it. I had to make sure, we had, as parents, had to make sure that although we don't agree on much <laughs> as exes, we had to agree on how we were gonna approach this situation, mm -hmm. right? And the one thing that we agreed on was calm. We are not gonna bring the hysteria to our kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was, it was, it is challenging, but um, I have to say there are a lot of us that are most parents right now, many parents are separated from their children. Yeah. And you know, if it were a regular day, we would be not thinking much about it, but the fact that we don't know um, how far this is going to last or what the other side looks like is forcing us parents to reimagine. Yeah. And that's one of the best things that came out of it for me the ability, the, the necessity of, of imagination. So we're unsure of the future, we're unsure of um, tomorrow and finances and food and health, but we can, re we can use our imagination um, to create what tomorrow should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about, um, you know, the broader picture and how this is all impacting um, the Black community, the LGBT community in, um, you know, really, really significant ways. Um, as usual, you know, we all know the phrase, America gets the flu, Black America gets the pandemic, right? The full-on mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, I know that, you know, these communities mean a, a great deal to you. So when you think about imagination, reimagination, um, you know, what sorts of suggestions, solutions potentially um, yeah. can, can we come up with? And I know that in your role as um, head of the board of the Human Rights Campaign, um, you know, this is something that you all have really stepped into in a significant way. Can you first just tell us what the Human Rights Campaign is for those who don't know, um, and then talk about what you all are doing um, in terms of addressing, you know, this rising tide of needs for us? So the human rights campaign is our largest LGBT human rights campaign. Um, and we uh, have programs that um, speak to and address and live in communities that are underserved and invisible to some folks. So um, LGBT communities, Southern communities, um, faith communities, communities that wrap around children and teens, um, and uh, the global issues around the LGBT community. So we have 11 programs that run and, um, and help uh, change hearts and minds with everyday people. And then we have a political side that helps to lobby and, um, and, ha and, and, and pushes for elected officials that are pro-equality. Pro so we're both political and we're hearts and minds, legislative, le legislative and hearts and minds. And I am the newly um, elected chair of the board of the HRC Foundation. 
And we also have a newly appointed president, Alfonso David, who is our first person of color, our first black man to lead our organization. So this, it's, a, it's a time that's, that's and I, I believe I'm the first black uh, chair. Yeah, perhaps. Um, I believe you are. Yeah, um, and that's really not so much of a, 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 a it, it's, it's a reflection on the sign of our times that in 2020, you know, we have our first black leaders in many areas and I'm like, okay, come on guys, let's, let's catch up. Right. Um, but we're happy that we are um, in this moment because I think a lot of what HRC has done has been preliminary work. So to say that we are somewhat prepared for this moment of COVID is a strange thing to say, yeah. but it is true in many ways. So in the neighborhoods that have are hit it, hit the hardest, in our poor neighborhoods, in our neighborhoods of color, um, in our LGBT neighborhoods, HRC has built community there. So we can go directly there to, um, to help serve needs um, and to help uh, speak for folks and speak with folks. And so, and I, and I look at that and I think, okay, um, how can our families think in similar ways, right? Because HRC is this very healthy, robust organization that with a very healthy, robust board um, and a very healthy, robust budget. And I look at my family and I think, how can we be robust? How can we be healthy financially and socially and, and sturdy, right? And a lot of it is pre-planning. You know, what are, our, what, what are the systems that we've set up? to support so that we can rebound from things so that we can address issues when they come up that we're not expecting. But it's like a lot of forward thinking. So what I, you know, what I like about my work at HRC is it allows me to work with um, communities that I respect and that I'm a part of, but it also allows me <laughs> to be a better parent. They don't know it, but I'm actually <laughs> drawing from HRC and thinking, how can I take these lessons um, of an institution that actually works and bring it to my institution as a family. And then I do the opposite. I think of what have I done at home that really works, right? As a mother taking a bird's eye view yeah. of the situation and then bring that to the board. So a lot of the work I do at HRC is bringing a motherly perspective. And I don't mean motherly like hugs and kisses and snuggles. I mean motherly like strategic architectural thinking, right? what is this, what am I building? I'm building family, I'm building children, I'm building a community. Um, and then I bring that, and, and, and a lot of, I know I'm going on a tangent, but this idea of building community is very important right now. Yeah. And this idea of reimagining, you asked me, how do I, how can we reimagine? Folks think that might be a, people might think that that word is trivializing a moment right now with a lot of death and a lot of loss and a lot of illness, and I'm not trivializing it. What I mean is that we're going to have to use some flexible mind work, some of that brain that designs things that have not yet been done to change one system, which clearly is not working to another system. So right. change one system that has been based on, you know, the highest return, the most efficiency and change that to something much more humane that is sort of like from the bottom up, right? Um, a more humanistic relationship approach. Um, and that's how we build our communities. And so I think a lot about this, Caroline. <laughs> it's all I'm thinking, like, how do we build a community? Whether it's a board or a, a home. Yeah. Do you think that we have the capacity, you know, I, I think across all platforms in our lives, this is shifting things. Um, and as you said at the outset, there's so much uncertainty that we're navigating. Um, and, and it's why I see your, your um, journey with this illness, you know, in the eye of it, as really sort of helping you to prepare for dealing with where we are now, because yeah. we're all dealing with this illness, whether we have personally had it or cared or known anyone who personally has it, no one is not impacted. Um, and I don't think we're yet even aware of fully how we're being impacted. But, but the one thing we know is that we're navigating just extraordinary uncertainty um, without, frankly, a tremendous amount of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so it calls upon us to lead, right? And I think particularly because of how this is impacting our community, um, we are going to have to lead our way through and out of this. Mm -hmm. um, we know that. 
And so one of the things I'm hoping to use these conversations to do um, is how can we best utilize the time we have now each day? What can we do, all mm -hmm. of us, to somehow help propel all yeah. of us through and out of this? Are there any things that you've you know, thought about or talked to your children about? Are there things that your children even have said um, yeah. that have struck you in, in their vision for you know, how to survive this, all of us, mm -hmm. and ultimately thrive beyond it? Yeah. And I, yes, I've been, yeah, I have some, some thoughts on that. Um, and these are lessons that I was thinking about in general as parenting lessons, right? And so whether we're parenting our children or um, mothering a board or mothering a nation, some of these principles are evergreen, right? And so one of the things that I know is really important is to dial down the panic, right? Dial down the drama and sort of usher in the calm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I've been doing that every, I've been trying to do that every day with myself and with my children. And it's the way we speak and it's the words we choose. And it's um, just an understanding that, uh, we have to bring as parents calm. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we don't, we don't think it's serious, but when we are in a state of panic, we're not gonna be thinking as clearly. We can do panic for like a short amount of time, but not long. So yeah. dialing down the panic and, and ushering in the calm is really important. Um, re relying on optimism and humor. Like, it's just something that we as humans need and we need it to get through time and we also need it to clear our brain. It's like. It's like breathing in coffee to clear the scent. How to breathe, you have to like have humor in the days to just sort of clear the air and yeah. get a reset, you know what I mean? Um, I think this is also a time to really encourage our children to be activists. So the, the goal, the, the knee-jerk reaction is to shelter our kids from all of this and maybe only give them little bits of doses of the reality. Right. Um, and to some extent, we don't, they don't need to be getting the minute by a minute updates on right. the severity of the issue. If you're trying to dial down the panic, then you right. have to limit their exposure, right? And you have to limit your exposure to the news, right? Right. And your, your children's exposure. But the idea of building activists yeah. is important right now. And it's going to pay off in five years, which seems so far from now. Yeah. Oh, Joe. Yeah. I so like build I go I'm losing you. Okay, go ahead. Let's start that again. Five okay. years from now it's gonna pay off. I think when we talk about building activists, yeah. it feels like something very far outreaching and it might serve us five years from now, but that's what families have to start looking at. How are we gonna survive this and come out of this and rebound from this virus five years from now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and those of us who can think about building activists in our community our children, right? Building activists in our, in our children. I think that's gonna be one of the ways we rebound. So I teach my kids to look at things. Yeah. And I teach them to respond to things. Um, and I show them what's happening in the world and then I expect them to do it on their level. So as an example, I have in, the, in my, my 14 year old said, well, it is just unjust mom that you get to drink coffee and we don't. <laughs> I guess I've been, I've been drinking more coffee recently, but he said, look, the distribution of coffee in this house is unfair and, you know, caffeine does not do all the bad things that you think and there's more caffeine and regular things than you think and we're getting caffeine anyway. So why limit my intake of caffeine? Right. It was annoying and it was silly, but I got his point. He noticed something that was unfair. He made a point. He protested for 12 hours. In the end, you still can't drink coffee in my house as a kid, but you can, I, I lowered the age. So when you're in high school, you can down. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but so this is a very like sort of silly moment that we had yeah. and it, it was an expression of his activism and I encourage that. And I think we need to encourage our children, not shelter them in this moment, but encourage them to, um, to notice and recognize disparities and then to uh, fight against them to change because we're gonna need change makers yeah. um, coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, so this show is called On the Clock. Right, and, and I wanted it to be that because we're, we're doing this during the work day, even though our work days have changed dramatically and the hours when we work have shifted as well. Um, 
but you know, I do think it's so important. It's, it's so easy when you sort of have a day that seems to never end in a way, you know, there's that <laughs> groundhog yeah. day reality, like Saturday might as well be Wednesday, it might as well be Tuesday, you know, if we're losing days. I know I've, I've lost a couple of days during weeks because of the sort of similarity each day. Um, but it's so important, I think, to drill down on this time and make it as useful as it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. So when, when you wake up each morning and you approach each day, you think about what's ahead. Um, I know that you have these sort of rituals and disciplines that sort of help take you through each day, but how have those rituals changed given all of this? And how much time do you spend controlling your thoughts because that's <laughs> such a big part of it. You know me. I try to control everything. Um, and in these moments, we realize that as much as you want to control, the world will not let you control her. Um, and I think the, the thing that I, that I recognize is what stands between life and death right now is humanity. Humanity. So I know the virus looks like the thing that is this evil but really what stands between life and death is humanity how we as humans respond how we interact how we treat how we listen um and so i've been trying to be in that moment more yeah um, so that looks like staying in bed an hour longer in the mornings um it looks like um allowing my kid who's demanding sit at the head of the table for some odd reason, like he's the leader of the house to take, to let him take that seat once in a while. I don't know, you know, to, to mix it up. So I'm, I have rituals, right. And I respect the ritual and the tradition. You know, I'm, I'm from a Southern family, black Southern family. I love tradition and rituals, but in these moments, I just say, okay, well, that's not how we normally do it, but tonight let's do it differently. Let's go crazy. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that's been able to, I hope that's been appreciated by the kids and by the other three adults that are in the house with me, but it's one step at a time. I'm not as flexible as I need to be either with my, with my, um, my, my folks. And so it looks like, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's moment to moment. I have a big picture of being flexible, being compassionate, listening and going a lot slower and in that I'm making all kinds of mistakes, but I keep going back to those principles. Yeah. And then the day will flow as it flows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, um, let's hit a couple of sort of quick, you know, sort of quick hit things, right? I'm gonna throw out some words and just tell me <laughs> in, in this current moment, just, and it might just be today, right now, um, how these things resonate for you, what they mean to you. Um, faith. Deep. Am I giving one word answers or can I elaborate? You can, you can come at it however you want. My faith has deepened. I mean, in, in all of my um, trying moments where people have said, well, what, how does faith play into this? I've, I've gone a bit deeper. And so I, I have to tell you, I'm not doing all of the Zoom Sundays. Sometimes I'll, I'll pop on and, and watch my pastor at Abyssinian um, live. But mostly it is prayer at dinner time when we're all sitting down. It is prayer at night to say thank you. It is prayer to ask questions. Um, and it is a faith in this like larger understanding that we have as humans infringed on the earth and on the animal and, the, and, and then just asking forgiveness for that um, and dialing back. So my faith has deepened. Here. Oh, wow. Um, I've had a lot of fear around um, sustainability of the family um and that has shown up in my annoyed tone <laughs> my snappiness with people my you know urgency to trim our expenses quickly i say look if you're gonna let the water run you're throwing dollars away right you know if you're taking uh paper towels drying your hands and throwing those paper towels in the garbage, we're wasting our money. So fear of how do we sustain ourselves? And that, I tell you, that keeps me up at night. Yeah. No joke. Yeah. 
Um, and it's like, you know, and I think sometimes, and I'm hearing myself talk right now, and this, that fear that I just talked about were, were on very small levels of, yeah. you know, paper towel and food. And, but if I take a step back and really look at that, what I'm saying and what I'm asking myself is the way we used to do it, does that work? Right. And, and we know it doesn't. And so right. I'm looking at the small things and the big things and trying to think of how do we move forward? And that is fear because it's fear of the unknown. Right. Right. Yeah. Freedom. Ooh. I take a run every day for about 30 minutes in my neighborhood and that feels like freedom. My air, my breathing is intense. My mobility, right? I'm not in one house. <laughs> so freedom for me right now is just a run, a 30 minute run through bed Brooklyn. We got to find our freedom. Yeah. Creativity. This has blossomed in our house. So we, I've always been a creative person and I use it in, in my daily activities. But right now, so we do uh, um, creative moments at dinner time every night. So it's either a series of riddles or a crossword puzzle or a game. Um, I just finished my children's book, um, which is called Born Ready, a true story of a boy named Penelope. And so I'm constantly trying to be creative because for me, that just lubricates the mind. And I, I feel you know, like I can make it through the next um, day, month, year. And, and so I've been encouraging my kids to be good. And when is your children's book coming out? Ooh, child. <laughs> I thought all I had to do was this write is, it. This has settled all the schedules, right? Well, I thought I just write the book and then it comes out. But, you know, the, the, uh, the illustrator has been so specific with the details and that just finished. And then you have to, so I think, you know, by the end of the year, you'll see it on shelves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's you know, exciting. like, so, Sorry. That's exciting. Something to look forward to. I think having things to look forward to becomes magnified now. Yeah. And like the thing about what, like we all want to know what happens in the future, but that future is, is partially determined right by right now. Yeah. So we got to um, create these things. And that goes back to my idea of reimagination and imagination um, and how that's not a silly thing. Like if we can sit down and start to draw things out, and if we can sit down and start to um, map things out visually yeah. um, with our kids, with ourselves, you know, it just feels like we're part of the solution. So I actually got some coloring books and some sketch pads and some um, pens. I really don't like <laughs> drawing because I feel I'm not very good at it, but we're going to be doing that at the dinner table, sketching yeah. and drawing. Yeah. So the last thing, um, time. When we, mm -hmm. when we do eventually reach something beyond this time. We don't know what it's going to be. Um, but what is your hope for, for the ultimate gifts that this time gives us? Mm. Right. If we, don't, if we don't hear the message in this moment, then what has it been for? Um, I think we, I would love for us to have a sense of um, compassion, humanity, stillness, Right, we're learning. Many of us are learning to be still. Um, and here's a big one. I've been thinking a lot about this biomimicry. Like, and that is like, you know, I'm not a scientist, but what I take from biomimicry is that you look at biology, you look at nature, and then you mimic it, right? And so a lot of our interesting technologies, like the um, thing that you go through in the airport when you do your hands up like this. Oh, yeah. The detector. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. based on echolocation, how bats yeah. see from sound waves, right? right? So that's biomimicry. And I think, okay, what can we learn from this? How do we mimic nature and not try to make nature mimic technology, but really use ourselves in, or mimic ourselves after nature and use our technology to enhance nature, but not to fight against it. So if we can come up with ways to be more um, like nature and like biology, and I'm not saying X out technology, I'm saying use technology to mimic nature. I think we'll be better off. I think that the learning right now is about listening to nature. And I'm not a tree hugger, but it's like, it is so clear right now that we have screwed with nature. How fast we go, how large our footprint has been, how sloppy we are, um, how many things we do a day. I mean, we need to dial it back. It is unnatural, and, and, and right now we're seeing unsafe to fly to three different cities in three days, like I was doing. 
right? right? So do less. If we could do less and still be um, the humans that we want to be, that would be amazing. Right. Amazing. Yeah, unnatural, unsafe, and we are now, unfortunately, being shown unsustainable. Unsustainable. So, you know, the sustainability issue is huge. Jody, thank you so much.